Good evening, Shavua Tov. Bereshut Rabbateinu. This is the 26th yort site of uh, Rabbi Meir Kahana. Zecher Tzadik Levracha, Shem Yenakam Damo. Rabbi Kahana stood for many things to many people. He was very unique in that way. He had tremendous courage, tremendous love for the Jewish people. But I want to focus tonight on Rabbi Kahana's Torah truth. Even though it was unpopular, he would speak the truth because he know only by following a Kodesh Baruch Hu are we going to be able to get ourselves out of the mire that we're in. I want to uh, give a short Dvar Torah on this week's Parsha to explain why telling the truth is so important. Many times a person can tell the truth and he is disparaged, people don't listen, he thinks he's not making any impact. But really he is. And that's what this week's Parsha is telling us. Two angels, but they appeared like men, they came to Sodom. Lot invited them into the house. And before you knew it, there was a mob that gathered outside the house people from every area of the city, and what they wanted to do was they wanted to homosexually rape these two guests, because in Sodom they didn't like guests. Lot tried to push them off. He was not successful. The thing that stopped the mob was the two guests, the two angels inside, smote the people outside with blindness. That didn't stop them though. They still tried to get to the door of the house so they could rape these guests, but they couldn't find the door, they couldn't see. Then the angels tell Lot the following, for we will destroy this place because the cry concerning them is great before the face of the eternal and the eternal has sent us to destroy it. The angels told him, or the messengers said, listen, you want to save your son-in-laws? You want to save your, your uh, daughters? Well, he had two son-in-laws that were married to two of his daughters living in Sodom. Two future son-in-laws who were engaged to his two daughters that were in the house. And the angels say, if you want to save them, go get them because the city is going to be destroyed. So Lot went to his family. And he said, listen, we got to get out of here. God's going to destroy this place. And it says in the Torah that he was as one that was joking in the eyes of his son-in-laws. They thought it was a joke. Now, you can't really blame them for thinking it's a joke, if you think about it. In order for Lot's family members to flee with him, they would need to have understood two things. One, that the place that they were living, which was Sodom, was an evil place. Two, that there was an almighty God who punishes evil. If Lot's family did not internalize these two points, then Lot was nothing but a clown in their eyes. They had to understand that one, Sodom was an evil place, which they did not, and two, that there is a God who punishes bad behavior. Lord was trying very hard to get his family out of there. He couldn't succeed. He even probably told them about the miracle that happened just a few minutes ago. They were trying to get into the house to rape these guests and they're all blinded. Just go outside, you'll see they're blinded. It didn't work. The question is, why did it work with uh, Lot? Why was Lot convinced that the place was going to be destroyed? And the answer, I believe, lies with his background. He lived in the house with Avram Avinu. He knew there was good and there was bad. He knew there was righteous and there, he knew there was wicked. So when the angels come and, say, and tell him the reason, Listen, this place is wicked. He knows they were wicked. He knows that already. He know, and, and the angels explain, listen, the judgment time has come. 
So now he can better handle that message than his son-in-laws who don't think the place is wicked at all. There's nothing wrong with uh, Saddam City here. Right? That's what they felt. They didn't have any training uh, otherwise. So they thought it was just a big joke. Rabbi Kahana, he spent his last moments in the United States warning American Jewry that there is no time for them, that they have to get out of America, that a Kurdish boy who's not going to allow them to stay in the Galut while the redemption is going on. And he was willing to travel to the United States, although he did not want to go. He tried to get other people to take his position. Even though he had premonitions that it, it was dangerous for him, he went anyway. And he was murdered at a gathering where he was warning the Jews that they have to come home. Probably many of those Jews there are still there. Yeah. But the message that Rabbi Kahana gave them is in their minds. And God willing, when they start to see the signs of things turning against the Jews in America, they will realize the truth of the message and get out just like Lot before it's too late. So the Torah truth, I want to explain, is saves lives. Maybe not immediately, but in the long term, the truth will save people's lives. I composed here a few of the truths that Rabbi Kahana uh, tried to get through to us, and I just want to briefly go through it with you. My email is at the top, and it's there so that you can write me if you have any questions, if you have any comments. It's important that you know this information. You also need to spread the truth, because unfortunately, there's a lot of distortion going on. Number one, Zecher Tzadik Livrocha V'Shem Rishayim Yerkav. The memory of the righteous is for a blessing, and the name of the wicked should rot. It's a Pasuk in Mishlei. And the Breshit Rabbah, right below it, explains this Pasuk. I'll read it in English to save time. And Hashem said, Shall I conceal from Avraham what I do? That's in this week's Parsha. God says, listen, I'm going to destroy Saddam. Should I hide this from Avraham Avinu? And right after he mentions Avraham, he mentions some positive things about Avraham. He says that he will be uh, the father of many nations. His descendants will be a blessing for the world. So Rabbi Yitzchak takes this Pasuk in Mishle and he opens with the following comments. Remembrance of a righteous one brings blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. Anyone who mentions the righteous and does not bless him transgresses a positive precept. What is the reason? Because it says in Mishlei, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, the memory of a righteous for, should be for a blessing. And anyone who mentions the wicked and does not curse him transgresses a positive precept. What is the reason? B'Shem Rishayim Yerkav. It's important that when you mention wicked people, that you, meant, you say you curse them after you mention their name. You say a righteous person, you bless him. Or you say something positive after you mention his name. Unfortunately, we have people, in order to be politically correct, even though they know, they'll mention Yitzhak Rabin, Shem Rishayim Yerkav, and they'll, they'll say Zecher Tzadik Livrocha after that name. This is, this is wrong. The first article in, in this book, Baruch HaGever, is a lecture that Rabbi Kahana gave. And he says in, this, in, in that lecture, V'chol the mitzvah lomar, it's, a, it's an obligation and a mitzvah to say, Yossi Sarid Yamach Shemo. Yossi Sarid, his name be blot out, V'zichro, in his memory. Achalenu, however, on us, he says, Lomar et kol it's upon us to always to speak the truth. Now, the government knows this also. And that's why you'll notice a lot of uh, leftists, whenever they mention Rabin, they'll say, Zecher Tzadik Livrocha. They don't say that with Ben Gurion. They don't say that with Golda Meir. They, they want to push the peace process that Yitzhak Rabin started. So therefore, they go out of the way to praise him. Also, when Ariel Sharon died, the Russia, 
they, they, the media went crazy when they thought there was going to be any parties, people celebrating his death, to the point where Ben Gavir had to get on uh, media and announce to anybody who wanted to celebrate Ariel Sharon's death that he would personally defend him in court. But there's an atmosphere, the, un the leftists understand this atmosphere, they want to try to get us not to be happy, not to uh, curse him, etc. Section 2, relating to the wicked. We have a great example from Hizkiyahu HaMelech. Hizkiyahu was a potential Mashiach. He was a great king. He made mistakes, but he was a great king. One of the things that he did, and the rabbis praise him for it, was that he took his father, who was King Ahaz, because his father was a Russia, he had his bones dragged through the streets of Yerushalayim to his burial place. Try to understand this for a moment. The king of Israel, he was a Russia, he committed idol worship and he encouraged other people to sin. King Hizkiyahu, when he became king at the age of 25, he ordered that his father's bones be dragged through the streets. It was his father, he was the king, but nevertheless, because he was a Russia, Chazal say he did a good thing. Let's look at the source at the bottom. A rabbi's taught. King Hezekiah did six things. Of three of them, the rabbis approved. Of three of them, they did not approve. Of three that they approved, one, he hid away the book of Kirk Cures. There was a book that was, that, that uh, told the people what the cure was for any disease. And Hezekiah hid it. Why? Because people were not relying on Hashem. They were not praying to Hashem. They could easily go to the book and find out how to cure their cancer, how to cure their sore throat, etc., etc. So he felt it was, that wasn't good. People need to pray to a Kodesh Baruch who rely on Hashem, and he hid the book. Chazal say he did a good thing. Then he broke into pieces the brazen serpent. If you remember in the Torah, when the Jewish people in the Midbar were, spit, were smitten by the serpent, HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded Moshe to take a serpent out of copper, hold it up in the sky, people would look at it and be cured. When Chizkiyot came along, he ground that serpent up into dust. Why? Because people started worshipping that serpent. The Chazal, the rabbi, say he did a good thing. The third thing he did that was good, he dragged the bones of his father to the grave on a bed of ropes. And Chazal said he did a good thing. Again, it was his father, it was the king, but because he was wicked and he was an enemy of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that was the right way to behave. Okay, now we're on page two, section three at the top of the page. There's two psukim that seem to contradict each other. The first pasuk, betuv tzadikim talot kirya uba'avod reshaim rina. The city exalts in the good of the righteous, and when the wicked perish, there is joy. Ba'avod reshaim rina. When the wicked perish, there is joy. There's happiness. But then it seems to be a contradiction because we have another pasuk in the same book of Proverbs that says, now we're on number four. Been full al tismach. Rejoice not when your enemy falls. And when he stumbles, let your heart not be joyous. When Saddam Hussein was killed by the United States, so I wrote on Janglo that we're having a party in the center of Yerushalayim in a, in a restaurant, and people started writing me in, writing to me. They said, You can't do this. Been full al tismach. It's a very, it's a famous Pasuk, and they know this Pasuk. How do we understand the two, the contradiction? So we go to Eliyahu Rabbah. Eliyahu Rabbah was a book written, the Gomorrah Tosfos tells us, either by Eliyahu Navi, or it was written by the yeshiva of Eliyahu Navi. And he deals with this contradiction. So now we're on number five. I'll read it in English. And similarly, it is derived from this. 
When your enemy falls, do not rejoice. And when he stumbles, let your heart not be joyous, lest Hashem see it and it be displeasing in his eyes and he turn his anger from him to you. That's in Proverbs. And furthermore, it says, when the wicked perish, there is joy. So how are we going to explain the difference between these two psukim? So Eliyahu Rabbah explains, when it says, bin full oivicha al tismach, first you have to understand oivicha is in the singular. It's, it's written in the plural, but we read it in the singular. When your enemy, when your personal enemy, when there's somebody that makes you feel embarrassed, you get ups or, or causes you to get angry, your personal enemy, your fellow Jew, this is what we're talking about. And the Eliyahu Rabbi, we continue, a Talmud scholar who wins you today in a halachic work. You're in yeshiva, you're arguing a halachic point, and the other guy wins, and he makes you look foolish. And tomorrow, a negative thing happens to him. The next day, what happens? He loses the argument, he looks like a fool. Don't be happy. Why? Do not rejoice in it, lest Hashem will see, and it will be evil in his eyes. Hashem will be upset. So when it says, Ben full oivecha, al tismach, we're talking about your fellow Jew, a kosher Jew. Unfortunately, people are human beings, and unfortunately, they may feel embarrassed or uh, uh, hurt by another person. They're not supposed to rejoice when that person gets hurt. But the Eliyahu Rabbah continues, but if a Jew wants to celebrate at the downfall of the wicked, meaning those that seek to do harm to the Jew, his friend, these types are completely wicked. And it is permissible to rejoice in their downfall. If you have a person who's out to get the Jewish people, he's a Jew, but he's harming Jews. And he's out to do them harm. Then, then there's no problem in rejoicing at his downfall. So, just in summarizing this, when it says, Ba'avod Risha Imrina, when the wicked perish, there is joy, that's wicked people in the eyes of God. Those are people who are enemies of HaKadosh Baruch Hu because they're harming the Jewish people, or worse. And when it says, Ben Ful Oivacha Al Tismach, that's talking about your fellow Jew. That person, you're not supposed to rejoice when something bad happens to him. In the Gemara, it also talks about this pasuk, bin full oivecha al tismach. And when Mordechai got onto the horse, he kicked Haman. And Haman, knowing his Mishle proverbs, he said, "How could you say that? It says in your in your own works, bin full oivecha al tismach. When your enemy falls, don't rejoice. How could you be? How could you kick me? How could you be happy?" So the Gemara explains right there that Mordechai answered him, "This pasuk, bin full oivecha al tismach, that only refers to Jews. When a Jewish person." is uh, falls, then we're not, we don't rejoice. And we see from Eli Yahurab, but we go one step further, we're talking about people who per personally irritate us, but not uh, enemies of the Jewish people. The Shulchan Aruch. Okay, turn to page three at the top, it's in English. When a person has a relative who passes away, he sits shiva. The Shulchan Aruch tells us there are exceptions to that rule. Not only the Shulchan Aruch, but the Rambam, the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, and the Gemara itself tells us there's exceptions to that rule. For example, and let's I'll read it, I'll read it. All those who distance themselves from the way of the community, they are the ones that remove the yoke of mitzvahs from their necks. Somebody who completely doesn't want to have anything to do with, Jewish, with the Jewish people, he doesn't want to have anything to do with the Torah. They are not included with Israel in their actions and in the honoring of the holidays and sitting in the synagogues and the study halls. They are like free agents for themselves. We do what we want, they say. We're not obligated or bound by the Torah. They act like the rest of the nations. And similarly, ideological sinners, people who sin out of ideological reasons, the Mosrim, those that hand over Jews or Jewish property to the non-Jews. For all these, we do not become an onen, which means when a person dies, a person, the relatives are absolved from positive mitzvahs. They need to deal with the burial. 
And so therefore, they don't, take, they don't put on tefillin, they don't say kriyat shema, they don't have to daven, they need to worry about the burial. But if their relative is one of these people, then there's no such thing as own, and they keep doing the mitzvahs. We do not mourn over them, but their brothers and other relatives dress in white garments and wrap themselves in white and eat and drink and are happy. The relatives themselves, because this person is an enemy of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that takes precedence over the fact that there are our relative. And therefore, the, the Shulchan Aruch tells us that we need to be happy because an enemy of God died. I bring down the Gomorrah here to show you the source where everybody gets this from. Number seven. Whoever distanced himself from the ways of the community, and they that make themselves free of mitzvah observance, and the honor of the festivals, and sitting in synagogues, and houses of study, and the minim. Minim are people who have ideological problems with God. Either they believe in two gods, they believe that God came there was a God before God, uh, God has a body, uh, etc. Um, and those that joined another religion, they converted out of Judaism. And those that hand over Jews or Jewish property to the non-Jews, like people who give up land of Eretz Israel to the, to the Goyim, or it's bad, or send over Jews to sit in prison in uh, foreign countries. It is not enough that you do not mourn over them, the Gomorrah says, but their relatives should rejoice and wear white and, and eat and drink and are happy. Since the haters of Hashem have died. Today, in, in the politically correct world, these things are not politically correct. But Rabbi Kahana was very clear. There is a difference between good and bad, righteous and wicked, and we have to know this and act upon it so that we can be healthy Jews. Section 5, we're on number 8. Lo yeshvu ba'artzicha. There's a commandment in the Torah that non-Jews are not allowed to live in the land of Israel. Not just enemies of the Jewish people. No non-Jew who does not recognize Hashem, the God of the Jewish people, as the true God, and keeps the Sheva Mitzvah's B'nai Noach, there's no way he's allowed to live here at all. And we have a commandment, lo yeshvu ba'artzicha. They're not allowed to live in the land. The Chazanish explains this is incumbent upon every Jew. You might think this is just for the government. No, it's upon every Jew who has to do what he can to make sure that non-Jews don't live in this land. And the, and the Torah tells us why. He gives, the Torah gives us a reason. Pen yachti otchali, lest they cause you to sin against me, Hashem says. Ki ta'avodet Elohehem when you will serve their gods. Ki ye will be a snare for you. It's going to be dangerous for you. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, in the last source on this source sheet here, but I'm going to just say it outside, he explains the reasoning behind this. If you take a Jew and you want to send him to a university campus for four years, what do you expect that's going to come out from that? Right? He's, a, he's surrounded by people who are not Torah Jews. He's influenced by all kinds of foreign culture and shtuyot and promiscuity. What do you expect that he's going to come out after four years? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, how could I let non-Jews live here in the land with all their foreign concepts? How, how can I expect you not to be influenced by it? So I'm giving you a command in the Torah, Lo yeshvu ba'artzacha, they will not live in your land. And that's, that's the last source on the source sheet. You can read it yourself. I just want to uh, quickly explain which non-Jews are allowed to live in the land of Israel because this is very confusing. A ger toshav is the only non-Jew that's allowed to live in the land of Israel. What's a ger toshav? A ger toshav is somebody who recognizes a Kodesh Baruch Hu, who keeps the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noach, not because he thinks it's a good idea, not because he's a moral person. He keeps the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noach because Moshe Rabbeinu commanded it from Har Sinai. Just, as, just like we keep 613 mitzvahs because Moshe Rabbeinu commanded it on Har Sinai and gave us the Torah, 
This Goy has to keep his Sheva Mitzvah's B'nai Noach for the same exact reason. If he does it for any other reason, because he doesn't think murder is a good thing, he's not a Ger Toshav. He's not allowed to make up another religion. He's not allowed to make up um, rules for himself. He just keeps his Sheva Mitzvah's B'nai Noach. Because they are commanded to him. Then he has to go before a Beitin. They have to make sure that he understands. Then he's allowed, we're allowed to let him live in Eretz Israel. But, the Rambam explains, not so fast. Only, we can only accept a non-Jew in Eretz Israel when there's a Yovel year. What is Yovel? A Yovel year is when the majority of the Jews are back in Eretz Yisrael and they're back in their tribal portions. When the Jews are back in their tribal portions, then we can start accepting non-Jews in Eretz Yisrael. No matter how good of a non-Jew he is, he's not allowed to live in Yerushalayim. When I was uh, davening with Rav Nachman Kahan, he says, I don't understand why they want the American embassy in Jerusalem because no non-Jew is allowed to be here. It's possible that they could have a Jewish staff and then it would be okay. The reason the Ger Toshav issue is very confusing is because the Rambam talks about it in four different sections. So I'm not going to read it with you now because we're running out of time. You can read it on your own. You have to understand these four sections and you'll understand exactly what a Ger Toshav is. In short, let's say for example, there's a Kohen, there's me, there's my wife, there's the Ger Toshav. Kohen has more mitzvahs than me. I have less mitzvahs, my wife has less mitzvahs, the Ger Toshav, he has less than me. But we all believe in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We all believe Moshe Rabbeinu commanded us what we need to do. Then, with that kind of a person, he can live in Eretz Israel, the Rambam says, when there's a Yovil year. The Ravid disagrees, and he's a, a, min a minority opinion, he says, if there's a good ger tosh, uh, there's a, a person that's like a ger toshav, then he can live in Eretz Israel even today. But the Rambam says no, and the Rambam is based on a Gomorrah, which says there cannot be a ger toshav until there's a Yovel year.